welcome to our third presentation in the 10th annual Soil and Nutrition Conference. John Kempf is our honored speaker. Um, I like to refer to I am honored. Hi, John. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Haven't given you a noogie since you got married and had kids, so. <laughs> Might as well begin now. <laughs> I'm honored to have you here, John, um, and speaking to a topic that is, I think, um, very relevant to many people, which is how do we use a small piece of land most well? Yeah, it is. That is an interesting topic, and it's one that um, I've actually spent a lot, an, an inordinate amount of time thinking about this presentation and preparing for it, because uh, I'm reminded, I forget who originally said this, it might have been Churchill, it might have been someone else, but something along the lines of, if you need me to present for three hours, I'm ready right now. Yeah. If you need me to present for 30 minutes, I need a week to prepare. And if you need me to present for five minutes, then I need a month to prepare. And this is a little bit like that, in that the question that you asked me in the conversations we've had is... Um, how can we manage with these principles of soil biological management and how can we implement them on a smaller scale as simply and as effectively as possible? In other words, make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. And uh, gelling it down like that has required quite a bit of thought. So go for it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. So, um, in thinking about this topic, um, I just described for Dan how it, it's been interesting and in, in the need to really gel things down. And what does it really mean to have biological soil management be as simple as it possibly can be and no simpler? And so, I put some thoughts together around my perspective and my understanding of that today. And I'm just going to jump right into the slide deck. Um, I anticipate my presentation is going to be uh, shorter than the full hour that you might be expecting. Uh, I'm not sure how long it'll last, but uh, probably more likely in the 30 to 45 minute range. So if you have any questions through the presentation, just uh, feel free to ask away. And uh, we're going to have lots of time for interactions, which I really enjoy, and lots of time for questions. So with that, I'm going to jump to the screen share and kick things off. Zoom has this annoying characteristic where it always blocks the present button here. Just need to get the keystroke commands. All right, so when we think about um, developing systems to manage plant nutrition and to regenerate soil health, the, the context around this presentation specifically is how can we develop these regenerative agriculture ecosystems that we've talked about? How can we develop ecosystems that regenerate soil health, that regenerate plant health and give us complete resistance to diseases and insects? And of course, ultimately uh, also regenerate public health and grow such nutritious food that we can really talk about growing food as medicine. So how do we implement these types of systems on a smaller scale market garden scale where we might have 40 or 50 different crops in a half acre or on five acres and, uh, and take into consideration all of the different plants nutritional requirements and where we don't really have the scale to use the tools such as sap analysis that we use on our large scale commercial crops. So it's really been an answer to that question of how can we um, take the systems and the process that we have learned and bring them down to a smaller scale so that they're universally accessible across the board or universally applicable across the board for all different types of crops. That's a bit of a challenge. I've thought, as I described, I thought a lot about this. And um, I think the, the foundational framing for us, for this type of approach to be successful, it can only be successful when plants primarily get their nutrition from biology. And 
in previous presentations, I've used the term biology supersedes chemistry. And what I intended to communicate with that phrase is that you can have soil with perfect chemistry. The mineral nutrition on a soil analysis is perfectly balanced. And yet you can still not grow healthy plants on that soil as long as you have poor biology. So chemistry alone without biology does not grow healthy crops. And this is one of the fundamental uh, failings of hydroponic production. However, the reverse is very possible. You, when you have soils with abundant biology and vigorous biology, but you have imbalanced mineral chemistry, you can grow really healthy crops in that type of an environment. And so it is obvious that if you have imbalanced soil mineral profiles, it's possible for biology to overcome that to a degree. And uh, I'll describe how you can determine what those degrees are for your soils and, and your operations. So this is kind of the foundational framework, the foundational premise of this entire conversation is we need to develop robust microbial populations and so that we can have, so that we can overcome any potential chemistry imbalances. So um, as I described the thought process and kind of the approach and the, the key uh, parameters as I was thinking about this presentation, the way that I've, I've come to the conclusion that this presentation, this outline that I've put together is really, it's the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And this is in reference to a quote that I think is originally attributed to Oliver Cromwell, where uh, he said, and I'll paraphrase just a bit, but he said something like, um, I really don't care about the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I care a great deal about the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And when we stop to think about that, for any new skill that we learn, if we learn how to weld, or if we're learning about agronomy, and plant nutrition, whatever it might be, at first, when we're just approaching it, or if we're observing someone else doing it, if we're observing someone else welding, oh, that looks really easy, that looks really simple. That's the simplicity on this side of complexity. Then when we actually try to do it, all of a sudden we realize this is actually quite difficult and there's a lot involved. And if we keep at it, we keep practicing it, then all of a sudden it becomes very simple again. And that is the simplicity on the other side of complexity. And it really seems to me as if though that, that is what this presentation um, summary really is. It's the simplicity on the other side of complexity. Because I looked at what I outlined and on the surface, it seems really simple and it is, but there's a lot behind it that uh, it needs to be executed well in order for it to deliver the types of results that all of us are really looking for. So some of the foundation concepts that uh, I'm going to run through very quickly. We need to begin thinking of our soil as a biology lab. To do that and to think of our soil as a biology lab means that one, we need to create the right physical environment for soil biology. We need to add the biology that has been lost. We need to constantly feed that biology with moisture cover crops. We need to provide balanced mineral nutrition and possibly if we're interested and have the desire to, we can consider speeding up the um, development of that ecosystem with foliar applications and fertigation applications. And then there's a few other nuances that I want to touch on as well, such as avoiding um, excessive nutrient applications and so forth. So you look at this, this is the summary overview of what I'll be presenting and on the surface, it looks relatively simple and it is. I want to begin by introducing James White's work on rhizophagy. If you're not familiar with this yet, um, it's, uh, I, you should be, and uh, you will want to learn more about it, then I'll, I'll just give you a brief introduction here. Um, this is the, the rhizophagy cycle work is, uh, was first, is based on research that was conducted by Dr. James White at Rutgers University and his colleagues and um, was popularized in several literature, uh, several white papers that he wrote. And then I hosted him on the podcast for an interview, conducted several webinars with him. And uh, his information and knowledge is getting to be much more widely known, which I'm really grateful for. But essentially, what is the rise of age cycle? The rise of age cycle 
is the idea that plants are getting their nutrition from living microbes, from living bacteria, particularly bacteria in the soil system. So this is a completely different perspective on plant nutrition than the idea that plants should get their nutrition in the form of simple ions, calcium, magnesium, ammonium, and nitrate ions from the soil solution. So what James is describing is that as plant root tips are growing through the soil, are extending through the soil, this growing root tip is actually quite porous and it is engulfing or in, a, in essence swallowing or inhaling entire bacterial cells. And these bacterial cells are moving back into the root. And as they move back through the, through the root and also as the root tip extends, the plant root releases reactive oxygen species, uh, particularly nitrous oxide, and it strips the cell membranes off of these bacteria. So now you have essentially naked bacterial cells without a cell membrane moving through the roots vascular tissue. And um, for that matter, eventually onward and upward into the plant. Then these naked bacterial cells are, or pieces of them are absorbed by the plant cells through a process known as endocytosis, where if you'll just imagine a large balloon, like a water balloon, and if you poke a finger into it, then you get this divot down into the balloon. And that's essentially what happens with plant cells is they capture these bacterial cells into these divots and just, um, again, essentially swallow them whole. And then once these bacterial, these naked bacterial cells are inside the plant cell, the plant uses either the entire, uses pieces and parts of this bacterial cell, the nucleic acids and um, different proteins and enzymes and so forth, and uses them to build its own cell and to maintain that cell. So then, however, some of these bacteria, some of these naked bacterial cells survive this process. They are not all immediately consumed by the plant cells. So as they move back through the root system, plants, uh, they trigger the formation of root hairs. And as these root hairs are formed, these naked bacterial cells move back out into the soil environment. And there's a few interesting pieces that happen here. One is that the plant um, also communicates to these organisms, to these bacteria inside the root, what its nutritional requirements are. So it tells the bacteria, I need more phosphorus or I need more manganese or I need more zinc. And then these bacteria move out through the root hair tips back into the soil environment. And really interestingly, plants do not just, these plant root tips do not just release the bacteria back into the soil environment, but they also release mucigel and uh, specific carbohydrates and proteins that are precisely what the bacterial cells need to reform their cell membranes. So the plant is supporting them specifically so that they can re-inoculate the soil and then communicate this informational message to the rest of the soil's microbial population. So now this message spreads, not just to these bacteria that were released, but it sp rapidly spreads to the rest of the, both fungal and bacterial population to say, hey, my host plant needs more phosphorus or needs more zinc or manganese. And the entire microbial population begins focusing on extracting more of those nutrients and providing it for the plant so that the plant continues to feed them. And then as this microbial population develops and, and extracts more nutrients, along comes another root tip and consumes more of these bacteria that now contain the manganese or zinc or phosphorus or whatever it is that the plants require. So this is, this is a really incredible process. It completely reimagines plant nutrition. And uh, this, these types of processes have been described in the literature for over a hundred years, but they have not really been um, widely accepted until very recently. And this is actually a really big deal from a plant nutrition perspective and from an agronomy perspective, because for the first time, there is an understanding of how plants absorb nutrients that are not simple ions. So we know that there is no one fertilizing the forest. 
There is no one fertilizing native ecosystems. These native, yet these native ecosystems have abundant, adequate or abundant levels of calcium and magnesium and all these different nutrients, uh, including nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. And where is it coming from? There are very small, very tiny amounts of soluble ions soluble in the soil solution in native ecosystems. And yet these plants seem to have really good nutrition. So this is an explanation of the process by which plants get nutrients in natural ecosystems. And our domesticated crops, the plants that we're growing for food or herbs and so forth, also have this same capacity. And it is this capacity that if we want to have robustly healthy plants that have highly functional immune systems and produce high concentrations of plant secondary metabolites, we need them to be absorbing their nutrition in this form of living microbes. So when you think about this, this means that a plant's digestive system is similar to the rumen of a ruminant animal, or perhaps to our own gut linings as well, where it is really the biology that provide nutrients to the plant. Nutrition is completely a biologically mediated process. And by the way, so what this means, when you think about plants sending, uh, feeding bacteria and, and all these organisms and sending them back out into the soil profile to release what is out there, this means that plants are farming bacteria much the same as we farm livestock. This also means that plants are not vegetarians. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Plants are farming bacteria and they're consuming bacteria and consuming entire bacterial cells as a protein source, as an energy source, uh, and as their foundational source of nutrition. It is how, this is the process through which they get not just nitrogen and, and um, carbon from the soil, but also how they get mineral nutrients, zinc, manganese, copper, and so forth. So what this means from a practical perspective is that we need to consider our topsoil layer as a laboratory Petri dish. We want this layer to have as abundant and active microbial populations as possible. And when we're successful in having this really rigorous biology, they have the capacity to supply the plant's nutritional requirements within some boundaries. And I'm going to talk about what those boundaries are and how we can um, adjust them and move them. So when we think about this as being a petri dish zone or a, a lab of biology zone, then it becomes obvious that it is critical to regulate water and temperature. And uh, this is important in any environment, but it's becoming increasingly important given the climactic vagaries that we are experiencing in the last decade or two. And <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. It is not enough in today's environment. It is not enough for us to say that uh, I'm going to develop really high organic matter content soil so that they can hold lots of water. And I'm going to depend on that as my mitigation to mitigate and give resilience during drought conditions and during high rainfall events. It's very important to do that. I'm not discounting the need for that, but having high organic matter content soils is not enough to mitigate the effects of getting five inches of rainfall in 48 hours or having that happen uh, three times in, in a nine week period. So these are the types of severe weather events that we now have to accommodate that we didn't have to accommodate as frequently or as often a longer period of time ago. And so now we need to regulate water and temperature within these environments much more closely than we have in the past. So what does this look like? From a perspective of regulating temperature, um, soil surface, a soil surface should never be bare. When you have bare soil exposed to the sunlight, it can heat up to a temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer on the soil surface, and as much as 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, three to four inches down, depending on how the soil was um, aerated and tilled and how much carbon it has in and all those different variables. We know that enzymes are denatured when you have temperatures warmer than 110 degrees. So anytime we have this really, we have a bare soil surface exposed to the sunlight, 
that has the effect of shutting down enzymatic activity and shutting down microbial activity. So from my perspective, if we want to develop these robust microbial populations, we cannot afford to ever have bare soil. Soils need to be covered either with living plants or with mulch. It's not acceptable to have soil surface exposed to the sun. <clears throat> when we think about regulating moisture, um, our observation and experience has tended to be that biology can survive dry environments. They go dormant or they live on the very thin water films on soil particle surfaces or within aggregates. And then they recover when rainfall reoccurs again, but they cannot survive and do not do well for extended wet periods. And when I talk about an extended wet period, it's not really all that long. Basically, if you have the soil saturated for about 72 hours or longer, that is enough to deplete all of the dissolved oxygen that is in the, within the soil aggregates and also within the water profile. And the moment you, you've depleted all the dissolved oxygen, now you have uh, now you begin having the effect of quickly changing the soil's microbial profile and shutting down many of the beneficial organisms that we need to have these vibrant ecosystems. So having saturated soils for an extended period longer than a day or two is really not acceptable if we think about managing the soil as a petri dish. And so I've, I've come to the conclusion that given the climate that we live in, drainage is an imperative. And um, there's different possibilities. One is if we, we have soil that has a good slope and the surface water moves off quickly, uh, and we protect that soil surface with mulch or cover crops or so forth, then that might be enough. But if we don't have the advantage of a slope or water moving off quickly, then we need to facilitate water moving off quickly in other ways. And um, I have, over the last decade, I've observed a new form of field tiling here throughout Northeast Ohio and through Pennsylvania that I am incredibly impressed with. Instead of using four inch drain tile um, buried 36 to 48 inches deep and 20 to 25 feet apart, we're now using, uh, growers are now beginning to use <clears throat> shallow drain tile that is only two inches in diameter and it's buried maybe 15 to 18 inches deep, 12 to 15 feet apart. And I have been really impressed with what I've observed so far. First of all, it is the, the drain tile is shallow enough and close enough together that when we do get those three inch or five inch rainfall periods, or when we have um, six or eight weeks of continuous wet weather, they are shallow enough and close enough together to rapidly uh, help that top A horizon, that top soil layer, dry out and allow us to keep our beneficial biological populations. And on the other hand, they are also shallow enough that they do not disrupt the natural water table. And they allow the water table to come up high enough that root systems can still reach down into the water table in really dry environments or really uh, drought conditions. So I've been really intrigued with what I've observed using these systems. They're now uh, the oldest ones that I've observed are about a decade old. And at this moment, I am still extremely impressed. Um, so when after we've looked at adjusting the physical profile in terms of managing temperature, managing moisture, the next piece we need to look at is adjusting the mineral profile. So um, here's an important piece. Uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham and other microbiologists have said that if you have really abundant microbial populations, they can supply 100% of a crop's nutrition requirements. That can be true, but it's not necessarily true. And uh, that can only be true when soils have the native geology, the native rock profile that contains all the minerals that the crop requires. So if you have a rock formation that provides generous levels of potassium and phosphorus and manganese and zinc and so forth, um, you may have a geological bedrock material that supplies all the minerals that crops really need with the exception of let's say selenium and molybdenum. And when that is the case, we cannot rely on biology to deliver nutrients 
that are not present. So um, our shift, uh, our manner of pulling soil analysis and adjusting mineral profiles has shifted over the years where today we have a slightly different approach. And the approach that I'm recommending for market gardeners, specifically for this conversation, is to pull two different types of soil analysis and you pull them one time only. Uh, the first is a geological assay from, uh, there's, this is essentially a mining assay. So this would be the type of, of analysis that um, miners run to evaluate the mineral profile of a rock ore sample. So there's a couple of laboratories in Canada that run these samples. There's Agit Labs in Ontario, there's Acme Labs in British Columbia. And um, while not a geological laboratory, um, I have been informed just recently, uh, our team has been using, uh, has been getting quite a few samples back from Midwest labs that are running this type of assay. And this type of assay is really valuable. <clears throat> because it can show us what minerals are actually present in our soils and geological profile. So many of you are familiar with the CEC analysis. And I still recommend um, pulling that one time only. Um, but there can be significant differences between those two when we look at different types of parent rock material. So uh, we had one of our consultants had an interesting experience just a couple of weeks ago looking at um, soil analysis that had this geological assay from Midwest labs side by side from soils that were collected in the Midwest in Nebraska, if I call, recall correctly, and then also in Florida. What was really interesting is that on the CEC analysis, both of these soils reported that they had 10 parts per million manganese, which is not enough for the Midwest extraction. We need about 20 parts per million. On the Florida soil, which is very sandy, the geological assay, the mining assay, also showed that the sum total of what was in that geological profile was 10 parts per million. In other words, everything that was there was already showing up on the CEC analysis. And so if you wanted to increase manganese supplies in that soil, you have only one option, and that is to add more. However, on the Nebraska soil, this soil was also only showing 10 parts per million on the CEC extraction, but on the geological assay, it showed 400 parts per million. So for that soil, we don't need to add more manganese. You just simply need to develop the biology to extract and to release what is already there. So um, this is how we're, we're taking a slightly different approach because we are seeing that biology has the capacity to extract these nutrients and make them available for plants, but only dependent on what the geological profile is. So our approach has been to use these geological assays to determine whether we really truly need to add more or whether we only need to um, develop biology to be able to release what is already there. So in the way that we are using the cation exchange capacity analysis, the many of you I'm sure are familiar are running samples through Logan Labs, which is still the laboratory that we use uh, primarily. And the way that we're using this analysis today, uh, we're using it primarily for calcium and magnesium balance and uh, for sulfur, zinc, and boron levels. And it's even, even zinc is a toss up. Uh, for zinc, we also defer to the geological assay for uh, to a large degree. And then for all the other nutrients, with the exception of calcium, magnesium, sulfur, zinc, and boron, we defer to the first assay. Do we actually truly need to add more or do we just need to extract what is already there? Or maybe do we need just to add a tiny amount to kickstart the biology and the plant system to release more uh, when they have a higher level of health? The ad an additional factor that we need to look at is paramagnetism. Um, this could be a whole topic in and of itself, but we know that um, plants don't grow from nutrients, as in NPK, calcium, magnesium. Uh, biology doesn't grow just from sugar and, and uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and so forth from all these different elements. 
Instead, they derive their energy from the energy contained within these molecules. And it's a bit challenging to talk about energy because it's such a nebulous concept and, and um, the word energy can mean so many different things. Okay, can be used to describe so many different things. So it's not really an accurate description, but what we can uh, conclude uh, and what is quite obvious in anyone who has evaluated the research is that soils that have high levels of paramagnetism support thriving populations of biology and plants do much better in those environments. So I believe it is imperative for us to make sure that our soils have very good paramagnetic levels. And uh, I would generally recommend adding paramagnetic rock powder such as basalt uh, either into compost or onto the soil profile to rebuild soil paramagnetism. And again, this is somewhat dependent on your native geology. If you are um, on, if your native geology is a basalt bedrock, then you probably don't need to add anymore because your soils are likely quite paramagnetic already to begin with. So once we've looked at shifting the physical environment and adjusting the mineral nutritional environment, now we get to the actual heart of the conversation of the need to regenerate biological activity. And so I would propose that on a, on a market garden scale, we need to build our own high quality compost. Uh, and I've come to really respect and appreciate the results that I've uh, observed with the Johnson Sioux bioreactors. And there's something that is appropriate and easy to use for a small scale, or you can also use vermicompost. And I'm an advocate of doing both. And that raw material can then be used to develop compost teas for fertigation for foliar applications. If that is something that we want to look at, uh, particularly for disease control and so forth. And it can be useful to add any necessary or needed soil amendments into the compost if they are needed. And uh, if it's appropriate from a pH balance perspective, you certainly want to, uh, compost is not the place to add materials for calcium magnesium corrections or pH corrections because you can easily have the composting system become too alkaline or too acidic. So it's best to apply that directly to the soil, but trace minerals and so forth can certainly be added to the compost and it generally has the effect of increasing their bioavailability. And then I have a recommendation which is a bit um, unusual, or at least I don't hear many other people talking about this. In a market garden context, I'm going to highly recommend avoiding the use of animal manure based compost or soil amendments. Why? Because what we have observed with our SAP analysis work is that usually the majority of disease problems, the majority of insect problems are a result of the excess of nutrients that are applied by the growers, not by deficiencies. And the most common excess of nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, which come or which are particularly concentrated in animal-based manures. So what I have observed is that <clears throat> it, is, it is very difficult. I won't say impossible because it seems almost anything is possible somewhere in the world, uh, but it is very difficult to develop excessive levels of nitrogen, phosphorus and potash in plants when our compost is plant-based. So we can add all the mulch and all the cover crops and all the plant-based compost we want but we don't seem to easily, as long as we have good biology, we don't seem to easily uh, develop excesses of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. But when we use animal manure-based compost, you know, in, in a market garden context, often amendments are applied or compost is applied in large quantities for weed control and so forth. And it's, uh, it's often measured in depth and in inches of thickness, uh, whether it's a quarter inch thick or two inches thick or whatever, whatever the case might be. And when you do the math, of how many tons per acre this actually represents and the quantity of nutrients that you're adding, it's an astoundingly high level of nutrients. And it is this over application, particularly of nitrogen and potassium that is at the foundation of most insect challenges with flea beetles and aphids and um, kind of the list goes on and on of all the insects that are a result of excess of nitrogen and potassium. So I highly suggest uh, avoiding excesses of those materials. Then the next stage, um, I am also have an unusual suggestion in that um, compost, 
compost teas, whether they are from Johnson Sioux bioreactors uh, or from vermicompost or the combination, in my opinion, are not enough in terms of re-inoculating biology. And the reason they are not enough, uh, they are very powerful, very useful, and I'm strongly in favor of them. But there are many of our uh, really beneficial microorganisms that uh, colonize the rhizosphere require a living plant root to propagate. So mycorrhizal fungi is a classical example. You, you will not find mycorrhizal fungi in vermicompost. You will not find mycorrhizal fungi in any compost because, or I should qualify that to say, you will not find it in any compost that does not have living plants growing on the compost pile because you have to have living plants and growing root systems to propagate some of this really important biology. And it is for this reason that um, in our consulting work on larger scale operations at AEA, we use purchased inoculants, both mycorrhizal inoculants and uh, other inoculants because there are a lot of biology that you cannot replicate in a composting system. Um, so I think that is something else that I wanted to point out that you really need to take a look at. We often find that compost, compost tea applications, they're very valuable and they do a lot to regenerate soil biology, but they're not enough to get to where we want to go quickly enough. So then the next step, of course, once you've added biology, you've provided the physical environment is you need to feed biology every day. They need to eat a, even more importantly than a baby chick needs to eat. We know that the smaller the animal, the more frequent feeding times it requires. If you consider a baby versus an adult, a baby needs to be fed every two hours versus an adult could um, easily do once every eight hours if needed to. And imagine what that looks like when you get down to the size of a microbe. They need a constant food source all the time. There cannot be a delay that cannot be shut off. So biology needs to be fed constantly, either with mulch, where we have the soil mulch with straw or hay mulch, or with cover crops. And I really think that uh, I'm a big fan of cover crops because cover crops do things that mulch does not. And, <coughs> excuse me, I've been doing lots of presentations and I've stretched my voice a little bit over the last couple of weeks. So <clears throat> I've included a list of cover crops that are exceptional in my current understanding of them in the ways that they develop disease suppressive microbiomes and the way that they stimulate soil aggregation. Ultimately, when we have this Petri dish perspective, our goal is to have that entire A horizon, that top soil layer be really well aggregated and be able to put your hand in as deep as that topsoil layer goes um, without any problems. And it soil uh, cover crops have the effect with their root systems of producing aggregation and, and soil aggregation particles much faster than mulch does by itself. So we developed this concept of using synergistic stacks when we put together foliar applications and uh, fertigation applications. And I wanted to bring this concept to, to this conversation as well because it's very appropriate. If you want to build on this foundation and speed up the overall system's performance, you can do that with fertigation applications or with foliar applications that bring these different materials together into a synergistic stack. So when you look at a synergistic stack, you can combine um, compost tea and a microbial inoculant, seaweed materials, plant nutrients, trace minerals, you can put all these together. And the intention, when I talk about speeding up the overall ecosystem, it is really photosynthesis that drives this ecosystem. It's photosynthesis that captures carbon dioxide and produces sugars and sends more sugars out to the soil biology to, uh, to reinvigorate and to speed up soil biology. So the more sugars we can send to the root system, the faster the soil biology will develop 
And as a result, increasing photosynthesis is really the pathway to achieving that in the most effective way possible. So this is why I'm such a fan of using these foliar applications to increase the photosynthetic potential of a crop. And uh, I would also add that when you use these compost teas, microbial inoculants uh, as foliars, then they usually, particularly if they're well-produced, they will have the effect of enhancing disease suppression on the leaf surface. So you will have less challenges with mildews and, and rusts and so forth on the leaf surface. <clears throat> so in summary, I would say approach the soil as a biology lab. We need to create the needed physical environment. That means the right temperature and, and water management. And again, I, I go back to where I started that this presentation, this sounds so simple. It's, this sounds, and it really is, it is easy to do, it's not difficult. But if you think that this is too simplistic and that, oh, I don't, it's okay for me to till my soil and have uh, tomato rows that are four feet apart and to have bare soil. I'll, I'll overcome that with doing other things by growing cover crops and so forth. You're not going to get there. I, can, let's, I just want to disabuse you of that notion right from the beginning. You cannot skip steps. You can't cut out part of the recipe. It takes all these pieces together to produce a really regenerative ecosystem that we're looking for. <clears throat> so once we have created the right physical environment, we can re-inoculate biology, and then we feed it all the time, make sure that we have the right balanced mineral nutrition. And if we're interested, we can speed up that system with foliars and avoid excess of nutrients. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. We could go see the interesting part is that we could go into lots of questions to say. <coughs> I apologize for my voice. Please bear with me. Um, we can ask lots of questions such as, should I add molybdenum? Should I add selenium? Should I, uh, what's, a, what's a good recipe for a foliar application? Um, I've deliberately avoided going into that type of conversation for this presentation because my intent has been to make it as simple as possible, but no simpler. And so when we look at this from a perspective of developing a recipe, this is the recipe. It truly is this simple and you will not be successful if you try to make it simpler. If you try to cut out certain pieces, if you try not to do cover crops or try not to keep the soil covered or try to uh, not have good drainage, Taking any shortcuts will cost you without really uh, any exceptions. How much it will cost you, of course, will depend on the environment and the context, but you'll not be successful at uh, achieving the types of results that you're looking for. So that concludes my presentation and um, I'm going to open it up for questions and answers. All right, we've got quite a few uh, questions here. I'll flow through them as well as I'm able. Uh, question from Matt. How do you feel about tarping areas with silage tarps before they are planted? Does it heat the soil too much and hurt it? Or because it's cover, covered from the sun, it can't affect it? Um, so Matt, the answer is that um, it is that there is heat produced underneath the silage tarps. And that heating effect does have the effect of to some degree sterilizing the soil. It uh, obviously it, in, it inhibits weed germination and um, it also kills biology down to a certain depth, which causes a, nutri a flush of nutrient release. And that's sometimes considered to be a positive. The question that you really have to think about, uh, and I understand this might be needed for, during a transition period or um, for, for management practices for weed control and so forth. So the question that you need to ask yourself is to what temperature and to what depth? So if you're thinking of your soil as a laboratory Petri dish, then um, are you comfortable, are you okay to kill the weed seeds and the biology down to a depth of an inch, down to a depth of two inches? How deep does it really take to get the effect that you're looking for? And do you need to go any deeper? So um, the advantage of course, is that if you have a soil biology layer that is really vigorous and healthy down to a depth of four to six inches or deeper, should be deep, will rapidly grow deeper if you follow this, uh, this protocol that I've outlined, and if you only kill the top two inches, 
then it can recover and re-inoculate from the bottom upwards very quickly. But if you have a layer that's only two inches deep and you kill the entire two inches, then you've really set yourself back very significantly. You need to um, kind of start over for lack of a better term. Um, there's a question here from uh, Linda. Um, how does one measure the existing paramagnetic rock powder content of the soil? So there are uh, paramagnetism meters um, called PCSMs, uh, Philip Callahan Soil Paramagnetic Susceptibility or something like that from uh, available from Pike Lab Supplies. It costs about $600. I'm sure there's probably also people within um, the BFA that have those meters and are using them because you really only need to measure once. So there's no point in uh, getting a meter. I'm not sure if there's any laboratories that are measuring this currently or not. I don't know the answer to that. Question from John. Um, if you're adding paramagnetic material into compost and then using the compost for teas and extract to spray, are you still getting the benefits of the paramagnetic material to the soil? Um, I would say the answer is no, John. My reason for um, suggesting adding it to the compost is because it does really stimulate biology. And so it'll stimulate the biological activity within the bioreactors or within the compost pile and is very valuable in that regards. But then I was also thinking of the next step of actually adding that compost into the soil environment as an amendment. Um, there's a question from from Dave, for CEC analysis, do you give credits to using strong or weak acid in the testing? Um, you just have to make slight adjustments in evaluating the results between those two. So we use both ammonium acetate and malic 3 extractions all the time in our work. So I, I don't think there's significant enough discrepancies on most soil types to be worth uh, really having a debate around. Um, the question from Daniel Kanda, how does one inoculate mycorrhizal biology into the soil? This seems very tricky because of the unique environment this fungi and bacteria need to survive. Daniel, when we have um, the approach that we have taken, which uh, has been generally been very successful, is to use mycorrhizal fungal inoculants as a seed treatment. And this seems to work well when we have seeds that remain in the soil, like a corn seedling, for example. So when you plant a corn seed, the seed itself stays in the ground and the seedling emerges. It seems to work less well when you have a plant that pushes the seed out of the ground, like a bean plant or a pepper or tomato plant. So when it pushes the seed and the coat out of the ground on the um, dicots, then you're, you have the effect of removing the inoculant from the rooting zone. So we still get some effects, but not as much. So our approach generally has been to uh, use a seed treatment as much as possible, and then also perhaps to just inoculate in the furrow at planting uh, or to put it into transplant media or whatever else is appropriate if we're using a transplant drench and so forth. <clears throat> um, question, why do I recommend moisture? In Germany, we say it belongs to sausage, but not to soil. And in monoculture, I see bad soil physics. Why are not legumes in your cover crop recommendations? So <clears throat> mustard is, uh, this is a great question, a great observation. And I should have clarified my addition of mustard. Um, mustard is essentially a biofumigant. And when it is, it is a useful, cover crop, when soil has become so degraded and biological populations have become so degraded that we have a lot of nematode pressure, for example. So if we have a lot of nematode pressure, then mustard can be a useful cover crop to add uh, and to incorporate to clean up the nematode population. It will also uh, damage and suppress the existing microbial population and then to recover and, and from that and rebuild from that. Um, it's not, uh, mustard is not a cover crop that I would uh, necessarily include in as a standard recommendation for soils that are already healthy. That's a great question and uh, Jonas and thank you for asking that. I should have clarified that earlier. Uh, to your second question, why are not legumes in your cover crop recommendations? Um, they could be certainly um, alfalfa and clovers and so forth could be in those recommendations, but I'm, I'm making these recommendations again in the context of market gardens and uh, keeping in mind that they often want to rotate crops very quickly. 
and uh, get back into um, vegetable crops. So I'm usually looking at summer annuals uh, or overwintering crops or crops that winter kill in that context. And legumes often don't have enough time to grow in those types of ecosystems. So they certainly could be included there. Um, but they also, I sh should also add that the legumes do not have the same degree of disease suppressiveness and they do not have the same degree of uh, soil aggregation as the other crops that I mentioned. So uh, I just mentioned those as the top five that I see bringing the most value the most often in building soil the fastest. There's obviously an argument to be made for cover crop diversity. And you could suggest that instead of having five species or um, five primary species, we should be including 20 different species. And I certainly would be in favor of that. But uh, just narrowing it down to saying these are the most effective that I've observed at producing disease suppressive soils and aggregating soil profiles. Question from Sherry, are there any smaller cover crop plants that can be used to grow between plants that can support the biology of soils? Um, you could do some such as um, white clover and there's probably a few others as well, but in those types of environments, uh, I would be in favor of using mulch rather than uh, using living covers. And my reason for saying that is because uh, the living covers do compete with these plants sometimes um, for water and so forth. And you may need to, if, if you're irrigating, then obviously you can counterbalance that. But if you're not irrigating, you may be, you may be better off using uh, mulches rather than uh, using living cover crops. Question from Julie. Hi, Julie. Uh, can a static compost of leaves or wood chips that sits for a year be as effective as the Johnson Sioux? The short answer is no, it cannot. Uh, I've, I've been really impressed with what I've seen from the Johnson Sioux bioreactors. And uh, there's some unpublished research which was done privately in Europe uh, from a grower who collected composting uh, compost samples who were supposed to be the premium compost from different compost producers all across Europe um, using different methodologies, um, all the way from humus compost, uh, using the Lubke system to uh, including Johnson Sioux. And I think there were seven or eight different permutations, dozens of samples. And when it came to actually changing, so they, and they tested them in the laboratory and they tested them in the field. And when it came to actually producing changes in the soil bi biological profile, the Johnson Sioux material or compost tea that was used outperformed all of the others, even though in the laboratory, it looked the same. So this was one grower's experience. It's very well documented, um, has not been published and I'm not sure that it ever will be. It was done privately, um, but I've observed similar experiences where the Johnson Sioux compost has been really exceptional. Question from Dave, how do you kill your cover crop? Lots of different possible options. You can roll it, crimp it. And um, if you notice, nowhere in my presentation did I say that you should not till. I believe it's possible. I know it's possible because I've observed it. It is possible to incorporate your cover crops with tillage and maintain this type of soil biology and soil till, as long as you then immediately get your soil covered again with the next cover crop or with mulch. Uh, and it certainly is possible to damage soil structure with overtilling as well. There's a few caveats that could be offered there, but it is possible to till soils and to maintain this, this uh, exceptional aggregate structure and this biological Petri dish. Uh, another question, does organic mulch or dead mulch um, feed the same microbes or similar enough microbes to the one that root exudates from cover crops support. Um, it's my understanding that they do not and which is why they also do not have the same rapid effects on improving soil aggregation as living root systems. The living root systems from the five cover crops that I mentioned with the exception of mustard uh, produce soil aggregation and stable soil aggregates faster than a living or uh, faster than a surface mulch will by far. <clears throat> Question from Matthew, what is your best estimate for the ratio of mineral uptake by biology compared to chemistry? Uh, the answer is um, in what context and in what ecosystem? 
if you're out in the, if you're talking about forest soils and how trees absorb nutrients, I would estimate that it's probably 95% uh, in favor of microbial processes rather than chemistry processes at being in the neighborhood of around 5%. Um, for prairie, native prairie ecosystems, it's again, probably in the neighborhood of 90 to 95% in favor of biology. <clears throat> A comment, you said that the rhizophagy cycle uh, describes how plants get their nutrients in natural ecosystems. I guess what you mean is that the rhizophagy cycle is one way in which plants get their nutrients in nature, in addition to mycorrhizal associations or taking up soluble nutrients. And um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good correction. Um, my understanding is that it is perhaps the primary way, certainly not the only way, but is the primary way. Mycorrhizal uh, fungal colonization and association and the, and the contribution of mycorrhizal fungi is also a very important uh, part of that. And I'm not sure exactly how the math uh, divides into how much the fungi are contributing versus how much the bacteria are contributing. But I anticipate between those two, those are the clear ma significant majority as I answered the other question just a moment ago. Question from Stephen. Um, Johnson Sioux compost seems great, especially as an extract to coat seeds, but the composting process takes time, especially to build a more complex microbial mix with fungus. So if you are just starting out and you don't have the luxury of time, are there seeds commercially available that are already coated with compost extracts? Uh, the answer is no, not that I'm aware of. Or are there compost extracts already made to coat seeds and uh, for cover crops and for cash crops? Uh, I'm purposely noting extracts rather than teas. And uh, Stephen, I would say I'm not aware that there are any extracts made, but I would anticipate if you connect with the right people uh, who are currently have their own bioreactors, you should be able to get enough compost to make your own tea. So that would be the route that I would suggest. Another comment, um, I think many market gardens have excess of levels of phosphorus like ours, which inhibits zinc and mycorrhizal fungi. Will biology overcome this or is there something I can actively do to address high phosphorus levels other than phosphorus solubilizing bacteria? Um, yes, biology does have the capacity to overcome that. And yes, it is a significant challenge. It goes back to the comments that I made earlier about many of the challenges being a result of excesses and nutrient excesses being applied. So. Um, obviously the first rule is stop adding, adding any more of what resulted in the, in that excess of phosphorus level in the first place. Um, it is possible. Um, I would particularly recommend in that in, uh, context, I would particularly recommend the use of oats and buckwheat as cover crops because both of those cover crops are strongly associated with mycorrhizae and they are strongly associated with phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. And they both have a uh, uniquely pronounced effect on releasing locked up phosphorus in the soil profile. So uh, I would start there and you will see a gradual rebuilding of mycorrhizal fungi populations over time if you use those cover crops. Question from Laura, how do you feed the biology every day? Are you talking about doing one of the following every day, such as fertigation or foliar sprays, et cetera? No, what I'm talking about is having living plants all the time. That is kind of the ideal or the optimal. Living plants that are green and photosynthesizing, producing sugars and sending sugars out through the root system are feeding soil biology every day. Um, alternatively, you can also have the soil covered with mulch, decomposing plant material, that would also have the effect of be feeding them every day, but it is not as good as having living plants and living root systems. Question from Leone, have you discovered any differences in the time or season in which uh, non-living soil addition applications are made as to their effectiveness? Hmm, that could actually trigger a really interesting conversation about what defines non-living. Um, but at any rate, how do you draw that boundary, particularly when uh, rocks are singing and uh, emitting photons of light? Um, <clears throat> in general, um, there are slight differences, but for the most part, uh, we, we are adding our 
we find that we add uh, most of our soil amendments in the spring rather than in the fall, unless there is a very significant and very large correction that needs to be made for calcium to magnesium balance. So if we're adding large quantities of limestone or if we're adding large quantities of basalt for its paramagnetic effect, then we would typically do that in the fall instead of in the spring. But uh, with those exceptions, um, except for those exceptions, we would typically do a spring application. There's a question about whether the Humosphere book is about rhizophagy, and the answer is no. If you want to dig deeper into rhizophagy, I've written a couple of blog posts about it that you can find on uh, johnkempf.com. And uh, I would also highly recommend the podcast interview that I did with uh, Dr. White, as well as an online course that he put together for us that is available on the Academy. A uh, question from Kara, are there any situations in which you might plant crops directly into your living cover crop? Um, the answer is yes, we do this all the time on commercial field scale production crops. And um, there's actually a lot of information online. If you look, uh, if you just do a search on YouTube for planting green, uh, you'll find lots of farmers talking about their approaches to planting um, seeds, not even transplants, but planting seeds directly into a standing green cover crop. Question from Tom. Um, do you subscribe to the Albrecht major cation CEC balance scheme? <laughs> Interesting question. Interpreting the Albrecht soil analysis is a bit like learning to speak English as a second language. Not only do you have to learn all the rules, but you have to learn all the exceptions to the rules. And there's a very long list of exceptions to the rules. And that long list of exceptions to the rules all revolves around the fact that the Albrecht soil analysis does not take soil biology into consideration. And uh, so I actually hosted or spoke, uh, taught an entire webinar on this topic specifically earlier this week, actually it was two days ago, and it'll be posted on YouTube in uh, the next couple of days, I'm sure. So um, I forget exactly what it was titled, but uh, like we talked about, I think it was titled Soil Testing 2.0. And uh, our approach today, we still use the CEC analysis on all the farms that we work on. Uh, we still collect those samples because they're what many people are familiar with and are comfortable with. But um, we primarily use them for calcium to magnesium balance, sulfur, zinc, and copper excuse me, not copper, boron, sulfur, zinc, and boron. Five elements, that's it. Everything else, we defer to sap analysis and or the geological assays. We look at the rest of the picture because uh, we find that there is no correlation between the presence of nutrients on a CEC analysis and actual measure crop absorption. Uh, there's a question, um, what are your feelings in using plant-based compost that chickens have access to turn, eat, and defecate in? Should we still stay away from this level of animal manure? Um, I would expect that would be less of a problem. The question is how much, or just think of it in terms of how much animal manure are you applying per thousand square feet or per acre? I would guess it would be quite minimal, but um, the moment it starts approaching levels that are measured in tons per acre, then we need to exercise caution. What are good trees to grow as a crop and overstory to blueberries? A tree that will do well in acidic soils amongst a blueberry farm in Southern California. I haven't thought about this and it's not particularly an area of expertise, but my thoughts immediately go to some of the honey locusts. And um, I don't know if honey locusts would be appropriate for that climate though, but uh, they would do well in acidic soils. There are, there are trees that would do that. And it might also be worth asking the question, what? Um, what trees do well around blueberry bogs in wild ecosystems? I don't know the answer to that question, but that might be a good place to look. Another comment this past fall, in addition to the fall soil primer, I inoculated 100 pounds of biochar with a soil primer mix in the hope that this would help more biology survive harsh conditions like very wet winters. Am I off base thinking this? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it's known that biochar does help biological populations establish, become established and um, maintain themselves. But when you, the moment you start using the phrase very wet winters, um, that raises some concerns for me because uh, what I can say is that, that our, 
in our approach, our consulting work at Advancing Eco Agriculture, we, we've been very fortunate and very blessed. We have a really great reputation. Uh, we consistently get really good results in the field. And we're at the point, we have a long enough history and uh, track record that we can look back at all of the things that we have learned over the years, all the failures that we've had where things have not gone well. And uh, at this point, almost without exception, the fields that do not perform as we would wish them to, as we expect them to, are fields that are too wet. Surprisingly enough, when we have uh, that when we take this biological approach uh, into a field scale environment, it will outperform a chemistry approach in a dry environment. So if we have drought conditions or drought stress, uh, an AEA program will outperform a conventional program every day, every month, all the time. It's not even a competition. But when you have really wet environments that shut down biology, that's where the biological programs do not perform as well. <clears throat> There's a question, um, when taking the mining assay, do you test the soil's A horizon or deeper or both? In high rainfall environments, do certain elements deplete through the higher layers? Uh, <clears throat> we primarily test the A horizon um, when we are growing perennial crops or tree crops that go deeper, we test both the A and the B horizon. Um, and on some soil types, even the sea horizon, we might go as deep as 24 to 30 inches deep, uh, depending on the crop that we're working on and, and what the soil types are. Um, but generally, for these mining assays, we are not measuring nutrients that are soluble. We're measuring the total mineral profile. So it sometimes occurs that uh, there are different concentrations of elements at different layers, but that is primarily an effect of weathering over a long period of time and sometimes even effect of, of different geological formations. Um, it's not really common to have nutrients leach from above down below with this that is visible from the mining assay um, because they are really extracting the total of everything that is there. There's a question, uh, what is my opinion on restoring or regenerating beds through a Hegel culture approach? Um, I think it can be effective. I, I, don't, um, yeah, I don't particularly have a negative opinion. I don't have a lot of experience with it. The experiences that I have had with it are, have all been positive. Here's a great question from Lorna. Once the biology and minerals are in balance, do you still need to add nitrogen-based fertilizers? I love this question, Lorna, thank you. The answer is no. Once we have really good biology and good mineral balance, there should be no need to add additional nitrogen fertilizer because the air we breathe is 78% nitrogen and biology can supply 100% of a crop's nitrogen requirements. And I'm talking about biology that is not dependent on legumes. I'm not talking about growing legume cover crops and in fact, I'm not even talking about growing any cover crops to incorporate for nitrogen supply. Soil biology by itself has the capacity to supply 100% of a crop's nitrogen requirements. And when you take this approach, um, that is a very easily achievable result. <clears throat> Question is, uh, is vermicompost preferable to other animals, cow, horse, chicken, et cetera? Um, I'm really referring to what is the raw material that your compost is being produced from? Uh, or in this case, what is the raw material that your vermicompost is being produced from? Are you using cow or horse or chicken manure and adding it to your vermicompost? If so, that has the potential to be a problem. <clears throat> Follow-up question from Lorna. Uh, can you recommend particular biological inoculants? Uh, the ones that we use and that I have experience with and I'm comfortable with are from Tinyo Technology and uh, you can find them on the Advancing Eco Agriculture website. <clears throat> um, question from Leah, could Wi-Fi towers and pollutions in cities where, there, where a lot of market gardens are affect soil biology and the inability for plants to take up nutrients? Yes. The answer is yes, they can. And um, Wi-Fi mitigation is, could be a whole topic in and of itself. Um, what I'll just say briefly is, 
that there used to be some technology available that is no longer available in the marketplace that would give you area-wide benefits um, to mitigate um, Wi-Fi and of all man-made radiation for that matter by increasing or by producing a coherent field. And um, I have it on my list to try to bring this technology back and make it available on the marketplace again later this year. Um, so you're welcome to follow up with me in about six months or so to see if that is available because I do expect it to be at that point, but I uh, have lots of homework to do before then. Um, question from Chris, what effect do you feel tilling has on soil biology? Well, it depends. Tillage, there is, we can't say that this is tillage because tillage can be a whole spectrum of depth and level of disturbance and the fineness of disturbance. There's lots of things that define tillage. So I would say that number one, tillage should never be deeper than the aggregated zone, than the zone of soil aggregates. If that's only two inches deep on your soil, then that's as deep as you should till. If it's four or six inches deep, then you should till that deep or you can till up to that deep and no deeper. Um, you also have to be really careful not to over till because uh, that obviously destroys soil aggregate structure and crumb stability. Uh, I also believe that when you till, there should remain an undisturbed zone of biological activity to maintain mycorrhizal fungal populations and to give them a place to recover from. So um, tillage generally has, uh, it, it has the potential to be a significant negative, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a negative. Uh, or it's not a negative that cannot be overcome with the other pieces that we're talking about. Question from Courtney, is soil that is uncovered during the winter less harmful to biology than being uncovered during the summer? Um, no, not really, because even though it's colder during the winter, it is still warm in fall and in spring, and it's still exposed to direct sunlight. And that ex direct exposure to sunlight uh, even in the spring when the soil is drying out, really damages soil biology down deep. So um, there is, there is, from my perspective, there's never really an acceptable time or a place for soil to be bare during the winter months. Uh, Follow-up question on mycorrhizae. I understand and agree that mycorrhizal fungi only proliferate on living roots. However, is it not possible or likely that the spores are present in compost? Um, I suppose it's certainly possible. Is it enough that it qualifies as a mycorrhizal fungi inoculation? I would guess the answer is probably no. Uh, in fact, I'm certain the answer is no because uh, we're not seeing mycorrhizal fungi colonization from Johnson Sioux compost or unless we specifically add it. Question from Stephen. Once you reestablished a healthy soil microbial gut in the rhizosphere in, in part with amendments, do you have to continue to add any amendments to much if any degree for plants to get the required macro and micronutrients including and beyond NBKs? Um, Stephen, the, the answer is no. The intent is to develop such a robust microbial community with a balanced array of nutrients and, and minerals as have been described by the mining assay that there is no further need for amendments. So the way that I think about, uh, I describe that we should take these two different soil types once in the beginning. And then from that, we make a set of recommendations that says, okay, um, we, need to, we need to amend these five nutrients because our native soil geology does not contain enough of these five nutrients. And it could be, uh, for the sake of discussion, we'll say that it's selenium and molybdenum and boron and sulfur and zinc. Then we look at those nutrients and we say, okay, for the quantity that is required to give us enough to support soil biology and to grow really healthy crops for the next decade, then we need to add this amount of selenium. It's maybe 50 grams per acre. So it's a really tiny amount. So that is such a small amount that we can dissolve it into water and spray it onto our soil with a sprayer. And we need to make that application only once, one time application and done. Then we look at boron and we say, okay, 
um, our soil doesn't have enough organic matter yet to hold and stabilize boron and sulfur well. So rather than putting on, it doesn't make sense to put on all the boron that we need at one shot. So we're going to meter out boron over the next three years. So we're going to put on this quantity of boron every year for the next three years. And similarly, when we look at zinc, and uh, I forget what the other nutrient was that I mentioned, but if we look at some of these other nutrients, we're going to meter out their applications over a three to a five year period. And then that's it. You should not need to continue amending your soils. If you do, um, your biology is not working because the biology should have the capacity to tap into what has been added and also uh, into the native soil geological reserves. Now, it's this entire presentation, um, Dan asked me to speak about what is the ideal? What's the, what's the ultimate manner that we can manage soils in these market garden environments, in these market garden conditions? And so I'm describing an ideal of what is possible from an idealistic perspective with uh, by managing soil biology and what has been demonstrated and proven to work in many different environments and in, in many different contexts. If this ecosystem doesn't work for you and you're not getting the results that you would anticipate or that you would desire, it's probably because your biology is not performing uh, as it has the potential to, perhaps because it's not being fed well enough or per perhaps because there's imbalanced mineral nutrition or whatever the case might be. But there's probably good reason why you're not getting performance. But um, the ultimate goal is to develop such a robust ecosystem that we, need, we do not need continued amendments. If we need continued amendments, then something isn't working the way that it was designed to work. Question from Daniel, uh, how soon does one need to plant new crops after harvesting to ensure the soil biology stays well-fed and thriving? Ideally, immediately, or ideally, you would have the next crop growing before the previous crop has completely matured and senesced. Would you consider a layer of compost applied as a mulch suitable to protect soil life? Of course, it depends on how deep that layer is, but you can find out this question for yourself with a probe thermometer, such as a meat thermometer, and putting it um, beneath the compost layer and on top of the soil layer. So at the right at the barrier's edge between soil and compost, and you can evaluate what the temperature is. Um, I, I described how soil biology begins shutting down at a, anything above 100 degrees or 110 degrees Fahrenheit it really becomes um, compromised, or I shouldn't say comp compromise is not the right word, but it really begins slowing down above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> Question from Bill, how do we assay whether there are deficiencies to correct when reading a geological assay? Oh, Bill, that's a good question, but now you're going to uh, I'll want a class on this as well, because, uh, so let me say it this way. Um, it's actually, it's not as difficult as you would expect because usually on these geological assays, there, there is often not very much of a middle ground. There, there's not really a debate about whether this, this uh, native bedrock material has enough manganese or not because usually it will be either all the way in on one end of the spectrum or the other. For manganese, it'll be either 400 parts per million or zero or very close to zero. So um, for most of, the, most of these different trace minerals, uh, which is where the question really um, is relevant, and for the macronutrients as well, potash, a potassium will usually be either 40,000 parts per million or 100 parts per million. Um, phosphorus will be 9,000 parts per million or um, 100 parts per million. So. When you look at this, there's therefore my understanding is that for a lot of different, when we look at this mining assay, there's there are not a lot of middle ranges. Uh, basically, we're saying that this rock, parent rock material, contains this nutrient or it doesn't. And if it does or not, it will usually, if it does, the, the levels that are present in the soil profile are usually very significant. Question from Lorna, do you think it is possible to recreate a highly biologically active and nutrient balanced soil-like environment in non-soil-based growing media like choir in a greenhouse that can turn, that can in turn grow highly nutritious plants? 
Uh, yes, it is possible. It's not necessarily easy, but I do believe it is possible. And to achieve that, uh, essentially, we need to, <coughs> excuse me, we need to build strong microbial populations in that choir, in that media, the same the way that we would in the soil. What is the best depth for mulch, such as shredded leaves and pine needles, to maximize microbial life in the soil? The answer is deep enough to keep the soil cool. If you're in a northern environment, that might be two or three inches. When you go further south and more direct exposure to sunlight, that might need to be four to five inches deep. <clears throat> In temperate climates, soils will be waterlogged in the spring after the snow melts. That's why we can't till right away. So would that mean that soil biology is seriously killed off each spring? The answer is yes, it does mean that. It does mean that soil biology is, is seriously killed off every spring. And it is not necessary, it's not necessarily true that all soils will be waterlogged in the spring. Healthy soils that are well aggregated with a good crumb structure and with good drainage will not be waterlogged at, right after snow melt. And um, so for those soils that are waterlogged for an extended period of time, it does have a negative effect on soil biology. Um, how do you measure paramagnetism? I answered that question previously. Is basalt the only rock powder? No, it's not. It's the most common one that is most widely used, but there are certainly other paramagnetic rock materials. Um, <clears throat> Question from Bill. So are the fragments of fungi found in the Johnson Sioux compost actually remnants from when plants have been growing in the feedstock? No, 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 not at all. There are many fungus that grow in the in healthy compost that are not mycorrhizal fungi. So um, in fact, the Johnson Sioux bioreactors, since they are never aerated or are never disturbed, they are particularly good at growing fungus. But those fungus are generally not the mycorrhizal fungi that are dependent on a living root system to propagate. Question from Ian, how do we measure if the soil biology is robust enough? If I had to identify one characteristic that I would say is kind of the um, overarching qualifier of what defines a healthy soil, I would say that it is aggregate structure and crumb structure and aggregate stability. So when you have soil that has a good crumb structure down to a depth of six to eight inches deep, then you know, and it stays that way the year around, then you know that you have really robust and vigorous soil biology that can supply all of the crops nutritional requirements. And if you follow these practices, it will become that deep and deeper uh, and this is where we get into the stories of how agronomy pioneers like Don Huber and others have talked about having these really healthy soils that they can put their hand into up to their elbow. That is simply a soil that has remarkable aggregate structure. That's it. That's really what it boils down to. Um, follow up question from Leah. Any thoughts on how a farmer's positive intentions and relationships with crops can affect the plant's growth and nutritional value? Um, that's another awesome question. And I see we're running up against the clock here because I'd love to talk about that one at length. What I can say briefly is that yes, a farmer's care and attention has a direct impact on the quality of plant growth and also on their nutritional value without question. Uh, it has the same, a, a farmer's, a grower's empathy with his crops has at least as significant, if not a more significant influence on plants than it does on livestock. So we know, we, we've all heard stories of how um, having a strong relationship with livestock can improve their performance. The same thing happens with plants. And uh, that's could be a whole topic for another webinar in and of itself. Uh, question from Jim, uh, Jim Porterfield. Hi, Jim. Is it important to check for arsenic and cadmium, lead and mercury? Does Midwest Labs geological tests cover those? Um, I don't know if that geological, if the Midwest Labs geological tests covers those. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of experience looking at those uh, potentially toxic elements. We know that there are some soil environments where 
they are abundant and we need to manage them, particularly when you look at um, uh, cadmium in California and zinc product, or excuse me, in spinach production. Spinach is particularly good at absorbing cadmium and lots of spinach has relatively high cadmium levels. Uh, and it's actually, I shouldn't say it's relatively high, but it's one of the nutrients that they actually monitor for. They measure cadmium levels of spinach coming out of California for a reason. Um, so I haven't, uh, I haven't really thought and research much about uh, whether we should be managing that or looking for that on more soil types, Jim. I don't have an answer for that. A uh, question from Norm, what do I think of using a conductivity meter? I think it's a very useful and valuable tool. And uh, when we measure the soil's electrical conductivity, that will actually bear out what I've been talking about, about developing a really robust microbial population because bacteria and microbial metabolites also increase a soil's EC or electrical conductivity. Um, question from Steve, how does one allow for seeds to germinate in bare soil and also keep it covered from the intense sun? Um, well, it's a very simple question, Steve. Uh, does the soil need to be bare for the seeds to germinate? I would suggest, I'm not sure which crop you're talking about, but there are many crops for which we know that the answer is that no, the soil doesn't need to be bare. And even if it does, it can be bare in a very, very narrow width zone rather than having 100% of the soil in its entirety bare. So uh, I want to be conscious of time. We're up against the clock. There's still quite a few questions that I haven't been able to get to. Um, thank you, everyone. I hope that you found it useful and enjoyable. And um, if you have any follow-up questions that I didn't get to, feel free to reach out to me on social media or send me an email. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Have an awesome day. Happy growing. <laughs>